Good evening and welcome to tonight's Venture Lab titled Pitch Don't Spin, How to Create Buzz Around Your Startup. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm a former Venture Lab and I'm a former chair of the Venture Lab and the Startup Demo branches of the Northwest chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum. Uh, Andre Gushin, the current chair, had to be out of town tonight and the team was a little shorthanded and so that's why I'm here. But uh, FYI, there are, there are 28 worldwide chapters of the MIT Enterprise Forum. The Northwest chapter is based here in Seattle, and it consists of four branches, the Venture Lab, the Forum Events, the Northwest Startup Demo, and the Mix and Mingle Events. Venture Lab's mission is to help shorten and straighten the entrepreneur's path to success by providing you with the information you need to get the job done. I'd like to thank our sponsors. You saw the long list of them on the, on the projector, and I think some of them are also in your handouts. I'd also uh, like to point out that we do have a really great panel for you this evening. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Watts, who will introduce the panel and MC the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Dave Watts, uh, Vice Chair of the MIT uh, Venture Lab, and um, I'm very pleased to see the turnout for tonight's event. Uh, I wonder if I could ask for a show of hands. Um, how many in the audience are here for the first time? Wow, <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, I ask how many of you are entrepreneurs? That's great, because that's what the, the Venture Lab is about. Um, <clears throat> what um, I'd like to do is um, actually let the panelists uh, say a couple of words of introduction um, by themselves, about themselves. Uh, if their bios are in the program, and I don't think it makes a lot of sense to uh, actually read what's uh, already in the program. Um, to my left is uh, Leslie Helms. Leslie is with uh, Seattle Business Magazine. I wonder, Leslie, if we could start with you and then we could just go on down the line. Oh, yes, and it, well, I'm sorry, we'll have to pass the mic. We've got um, two mics for our five panelists. I'm sorry about that, we have a shortage of mics tonight. Although um, there's one on the panel. <laughs> my name is Leslie Helm. I'm the editor of Seattle Business Magazine. I spent uh, seven years at Business Week. I was there, uh, covered Tokyo for a while, and then I was a bureau chief in Boston, covered technology there, was at the LA Times for eight or nine years, and then I've been uh, here uh, with Seattle Business Magazine for the last couple of years. Uh, Hi, I'm Kurt Woodward. I'm a senior editor with X Economy in Seattle. Um, only been there since February, actually. Before that, I spent most of my career so far, almost nine years, with the Associated Press in various places, mostly in the Western US, and a lot of it uh, here in Seattle and Olympia, covering all kinds of things, uh, some big business, a lot of politics and public policy, uh, so, yeah. I'm John Cook, I'm the co-founder of GeekWire. GeekWire is a technology news site based and rooted right here in Seattle, and we're about six months old. Uh, before that, I spent 10 years at the Seattle PI covering technology, entrepreneurs, startups, and venture capital. I'm glad to be here. I'm Mike Davidson. I'm the founder, CEO, and designer of Newsvine.com, uh, which began in 2005, was acquired by MSNBC.com in 2007, and I'm currently still at MSNBC. Hi, I'm Brian Dudley. I'm a technology columnist at Seattle Times, a 115-year-old startup in Seattle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> currently expanding on the web uh, after printing newspapers for quite some time, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, well, the MIT Venture Lab, as uh, Steve said, has a charter of giving entrepreneurs practical advice that they can use to help climb the ladder of success from concept to a real business. Uh, this particular program came about because we felt one of the overlooked aspects of creating a new business is how one gets noticed. The question usually arises because your business is seeking its first customers, partners, employees, and or outside investors. Uh, no one recognizes you, knows who you are, or what great new innovation you're working on. So what do you do next? 
Um, there are many proven avenues to greater visibility. Most of them cost a lot of money. Um, one that is less costly and often overlooked is the press. We are most fortunate to have this esteemed panel here tonight and to have a sizable contingent of press that reports on business and high technology in the Seattle area. Um, this is a symbiotic relationship between the community and the press that I think benefits everyone and can even help strengthen our position as a leading center for high tech industry and investment. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to start our our discussion and by cutting to the chase and asking our panelists to address the three questions that we have in our program description. I'm going to do this in reverse order from the description because it just seems to flow more logically, the written description. Uh, in terms of format, I would like each of you to take no more than five minutes answering the first question. Then I will call for a volunteer from the panel to help kick off numbers two or three. Um, after we've gone through these three questions, we'll open the floor to the audience and the moderator will basically step out of the picture unless the, the crowd gets unruly, unruly, in which case I will get out my big stick, or things bog down, in which case I do have additional questions of my own. So let's begin with the first question, which hopefully will give us a little more insight into each of our panelists, and the question has a part A and a part B, and there may be a prize for a correct answer. So, um, first question, how does the high-tech business reporting landscape look today and what are the trends you see? Part B, aside from hiring a professional publicist, what are the resources available to entrepreneurs in this landscape? Does that sound like a good question? Go ahead, Leslie, give it a shot. Well, let me just start by describing a little bit about Sale Business Magazine. It's a, it's a monthly, and our audience is uh, mid, mid and uh, senior level executives and, and company owners. We tend to do a lot of uh, corporate profiles, a lot of uh, sort of industry trend stories, and uh, you know, basically anything that we think will be of interest to our, our general business audience. We recently did a story on management of the arts. We do a, a pr quite a broad range of stories. We are very interested in the, in the venture sector in particular because uh, our readers are interested. They want to know what the, what the technology trends are. They want to know what, uh, you know, what businesses are, are out there, what, 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 what's, what's coming up and what they should be looking out for. Uh, we, from our perspective, um, in terms of what resources you have, I guess what kinds of stories might you be, you know, what might we be interested in? What kind of things do we look at? Uh, there are, I would say, three or four areas in particular. We have a, a section we call Bright Ideas. Our magazine starts with a one-page feature on a typically a venture company. It doesn't have to be a venture company, but it's called uh, Bright Ideas, and it's basically a company that has. Uh, an interesting idea, an interesting new technology, new business model, uh, and and that's that that's a wide open. I mean, we'll take relatively early stage companies for this. We want, you know, obviously to. Two years ago, we did one on Swipe. Obviously, that was a success story. We'd love to be doing more of that kind of story. Uh, we also have uh, small venture companies or. or uh, can 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 if they're part of a trend, we will be covering them. So, for example, we did a story on on gamification, and there's you know a lot of uh, smaller companies that are in this field here in, in Seattle. So we we profiled uh, six or seven of those companies. Uh, the other sort of entry point for for uh, a an, general audience, we have we have two guest columns. One is uh, called CEO Advisor. So this is for uh, people who want to advise an executive. Uh, the other one's commentary about more general uh, general uh, issues of debate. And again, that's open to, to, to any outside writer. And then we have uh, a variety of uh, contests so that, for example, I know I, I saw somebody from Edifex recently, and one of our several contests is, is healthcare, uh, leaders in healthcare, and Edifex won one of the categories and they got into our magazine in that way. So those are some of the ways in, 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 in which uh, people can, can pitch to the magazine. Um, on the first part of, you know, how does the, what's the high tech business reporting landscape look like today? What are the trends? Uh, I think probably the main macro overall trend is just that there are, um, 
million entry points. There's a lot of people who are putting out information that, you know, even five, six, seven, eight years ago was mostly the province of, you know, old school journalists. And now you've got a lot of VC bloggers out there, a lot of entrepreneurs who are blogging. That information is coming out um, um, in a really... Um, in a really authentic way sometimes. I mean, in the best cases, um, people talking about um, what's going on in VC. There's a few superstar kind of well-known venture capitalist bloggers around the country who've really made names for themselves trying to bring more transparency to that. They can probably tell you a lot more about how venture capital works than I can, right? Um, <laughs> so from them all the way through, you know, individual bloggers to more established professional reporter types who are working online or in newspapers all the way up to magazines, there's there is just a lot of attention and a lot of people covering it um, uh, these days. And um, uh, as far as resources, particularly for entrepreneurs, I say it, it's part of that. Um, you know, be out there and it, it's not going to hurt for you as an entrepreneur, uh, as a startup, by blogging about your company, putting out information, looking at trends, right? Be somebody who's on the beat, essentially, and informed and, uh, you know, generating information that is valuable beyond, you know, here's the three reasons why my, why my app is really cool. Um, you know, something genuine and interesting that, that you see as a business person who's out there, as an entrepreneur who's out there. Um, and if you don't want to blog it, um, you know, email me and let's go have lunch and you can tell me on background and I'll write about it. <laughs> That's why we do what we do. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Kurt there. I mean, there's just a plethora of uh, news sources available for uh, for folks out there, places to share your message, get the, get, get your story out. Um, I would say just choosing where to go with your story is an important thing to think about. Um, you know, you can funnel it through another, on your own blog and have no one read it or put, post things on your Twitter account and have no one read it. So it's, it is still, I think, important to have channels to go through where, uh, where people are reading and a community has gathered. I mean, that's super important to us at, at GeekWire is to have uh, you know, a very strong community of people that not only come and read and consume the news, but participate and come to our events or share their comments uh, in the comment threads of the stories or provide us with a guest post on you know, as Kurt was saying, the the you know their inside perspective on on what's going on. A great example is um, you know you mentioned Swipe here earlier. I was actually on the judging panel of that back in the day and saw that saw that first pitch, and there was certainly a buzz. Um, so we we covered that story obviously when they got sold here this past week, and uh, it was a great story for Seattle. But the one thing that we did, which was, which was a little different, was I went back to one of the angel investors who was in that deal, Bill Bryant, who was also on the judging panel that night, and we, had a, we just had an email dialogue going back and forth, and he started sharing this great story about how he had never seen this company, like a, a company like Swipe before, and it was just fantastic. And I said, Bill, this, you gotta share this. You gotta put this out there for the community. Would you mind doing this as a guest post on GeekWire? And he was like, yeah, sure. And so that's a little bit about how the dynamic, I think, has changed a little bit. Is We see ourselves kind of as a platform and a community and a place for discussion, more so than just a, um, us pushing content out to, to the masses. Now, we do have a very high bar in terms of what we, what we take in from, from guest contributors, but it does speak to, uh, I think, how things have changed quite a bit, certainly back to the day when I was at the Seattle PI, and it was you know, uh, just kind of the newspaper format of you printed it and forgot about it. There wasn't much interaction with the reader. Um, those days are, are gone. And I think it's for the better, frankly. I think uh, we learn more, we get more interaction with people, and I love it, frankly. Um, in terms of resources, I'm not sure I totally understand that question. I mean, you have your story to tell as an entrepreneur, and that's we love everybody up here loves telling stories and so you got to just kind of hone your pitch and know what uh know what people know what individual reporters kind of want and and have something unique and compelling to to say um and i'm sure every one of us up here would want to tell those stories um <clears throat> good answer so far uh i agree there's just a lot of stuff out there right now i mean anybody could start their own little micro business blog with a micro niche that targets a micro audience and there's just thousands and thousands of these things out there now um, but I think the key to know as an entrepreneur is who matters right not everybody matters everybody thinks they matter but not everybody matters 
And within the spectrum of mattering, who actually matters does not necessarily uh, match up with who we perceive to matter. So let me explain that a little bit. Um, you would think that getting a mention in the print edition of the New York Times would be the tipping point for your startup, right? So you just released this product and the New York Times print edition picked you up, mentioned you, oh my God, we're gonna be in the New York Times. You wake up the next day, all the East Coast people have already, have already awoken and read the paper and you look at your server logs and you got nothing. You got nothing. Believe me, a, men a print mention in the New York Times does nothing for you traffic wise. Yes, you'll get a few extra visitors, but believe me, it's happened to us. You're not gonna notice a huge upswing in traffic from a print mention in the New York Times. Why? Because there are no hyperlinks in the print world. Now, you get mentioned in the online edition of the New York Times without a link, same thing happens, not much effect. You get mentioned in uh, um, uh, a New York Times blog that actually links to your site, you will get some traffic from that. You get mentioned in Daring Fireball, you'll get a hundred times the traffic that the New York Times sends you. Who here even knows what Daring Fireball is? Hopefully a lot of people, right? But not the whole room, right? Certainly Daring Fireball does not have the type of global brand recognition that the New York Times has. But if you're developing an iPhone app, <clears throat> one of the most important things that you can have as, a, as, as the developer of that app is a cordial relationship with John Gruber who runs Daring Fireball because the amount of traffic that he sends you is so huge compared to so many of these other sources that we that, that we think are big. So I think, you know, when you, when you hear about the tech crunches of the world and the business insiders of the world, you know, search, search into that a little bit. Find entrepreneurs who've been linked to by these multiple sources and see what they think. There's a great post by um, Marco Arment, developer of Instapaper, where he lists, he has this beef with Business Insider, right? Because Business Insider basically steals his articles and puts, yeah, puts the, puts the Marco byline on there and pretends that Marco actually writes for Business Insider and he doesn't actually write for Business Insider. And so he actually looked at his server logs going all the way back to 2009 to see who sent him the most traffic. And like Daring Fireball was like over a half a million visitors, you know, uh, uh, Stumble Upon was like, you know, in that area too. And then it just kind of cascaded down from there. And like Business Insider was like 20,000 or like 15,000, like not even close to what he's getting from these other sorts of sites. So depending on what vertical your startup is in, you need to know who the influencers are, what, you know, what the actual important publications are to, um, to, to, to help you publicize your, your, your product. You know, being a Seattle entrepreneur, the, the people at this table are the first people that I would tell about my product. I wouldn't go to the New York Times and, and, and start there. Um, I think the other important concept there is one link from anybody is not gonna do anything for you. You really want a cluster of people talking about you at any given time. So maybe, maybe you scoop John with the exclusive or you scoop Briar with the exclusive, and they get the initial burst of traffic, and then somebody else writes about you, and somebody else writes about you. Before you know it, you've got 50 sources of traffic pointing at you at the same time, and that's when you really get people starting to talk about your startup at the right time, when hopefully your servers can handle it. Um, <clears throat> second part of the question is, what tools do you have available to you? And I would say the number one tool that you have available to you as a startup entrepreneur is um, courage and the idea that you have nothing to lose. And if you're not able to take the concept of having nothing to lose as a startup and turn that to your advantage, you probably shouldn't be an entrepreneur. You need to take the sorts of risks as an entrepreneur that you can't take working for a big company. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm mildly qualified to be on this panel with these great journalists, I'm not a journalist, um, is that, you know, when, I, when we were starting Newsvine in 2005, we were kind of not really on the map. You know, we got a little bit of press at the beginning. We weren't really kind of in the public conversation yet. And uh, I, I took the opportunity to play a little prank on John McCain when he was running for president. Um, I had noticed that a MySpace tutorial that I had written uh, a, year, a year or two prior um, that had gotten picked up by you know, a lot of people. A lot of people were using my, you know, using my template to make their own MySpace templates. I noticed that John McCain's own MySpace page was using my template. And in the little contact us section, he was actually using my graphic. So the graphic was coming off my server. So every time he a user pulled up John McCain's <laughs> MySpace page, my graphic was, was being served up. And so I saw that in my server logs and I was like, hmm. I can change that graphic to whatever I want. <laughs> Whenever I want. So I spent a couple of days kind of thinking of like good things, to, good things to swap in there and good times to do it. And I ended up coming up with a, 
uh, a fake handwritten message from John McCain saying that he had he had reversed his position and come out in support of gay marriage. Um, and a few more things. Uh, and I, I called uh, Mike Arrington, who I've got a good relationship with, and I said, hey, we're going live with this at like 10 a.m., just letting you know, just telling you first. Uh, and they, they were ready to go with the story. We went live with it. They had their story up in about 20 minutes. And the next thing I knew, everybody was picking it up. ABC News picked it up. NBC picked it up. Every blog picked it up. Everybody was talking about it. And a week later, it was on The Daily Show. So somebody, you know, and, and it, that was sort of like the point at which we began to be part of the conversation. And I, I remember thinking to myself, oh, wow, that was not that hard to do. Um, <laughs> but when I got to MSNBC, when we were actually became part of MSNBC, we had a little Q&A session with all the reporters in the newsroom, like, like hey, how's it going? What, what's this relationship going to look like? And one of the reporters actually asked me, that thing that you did to McCain, would you do that as part of our company? And it was a tough question to answer because, you know, I, my initial reaction was, of course. And then I, I started thinking about it, and I was like, you know what? I bet you neither Microsoft nor NBC would be happy about an employee of theirs doing that. And that's kind of where, where it hit me, where it's like that sort of PR, that sort of publicity hunting, you can't do unless you are, uh, unless you have the mindset that you've got in the Middle East. I'm just trying to repeat the question to myself in my head here. <laughs> uh, but News, uh, news is all over the place, and I think you need to, technology news in particular, we cover technology news all the way down to, you know, one guy in his garage, you know, the pajama Hadeen doing, doing blogs. But I would think, approach it, approach the question maybe from which communities uh, are covered, you know, where do communities get their news about technology? So for instance, the web tech startup communities have a pretty, established group of news sources that they use they use to reach out they communicate that they, they get two hundred thousand dollars of angel funding and blah 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 the, the bankers come in and say they're raising money they got money available you know all these this, this kind of discussion that, that's necessary for that kind of business happens a, lo a lot of the times through the news sources in that community they're, they're established it's great they perform great service for each other they help each other out uh, I don't know if you guys are all web startup types who are out looking for traffic and looking for clicks and thinking you need Google on your side to, to, to make your break. Or if you know if you have, you know, who knows, offline businesses, whatever, you might think about which news sources serve the communities that you're trying to serve with your company. So uh, I'm coming at this from the perspective of the largest news source in the Northwest and the you know second largest newspaper on the West Coast. And it, our community really is kind of the Northwest, if you think about it. But then because we have this big website that gets 10 million people a month, and da 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 da, da in a way our, our community is the world. It's people that's, that are interested in what's going on in Seattle and the Northwest. So, you know, y you can shoot as high as you want and try and, you know, make the big scatter shot that gets as many people with your stories. Uh, you might think, though, what are you trying to communicate? Are you trying to announced your company so that you can maybe catch the eye of a venture capitalist or a partner company who is glued to TechCrunch and watching every little post that comes up. Because, you know, go for it. That's, that's very competitive, though. Keep that in mind, too. Uh, if you are trying to reach a broad audience or you're trying to tell your friends and neighbors and, you know, people down the street and maybe your community banker what you're doing, you might think about the regional, local news sources. You know, uh, people in the business cover, people in the business read lots and lots of news sources. It's not like, nowadays people consume news all over the place. They spend lots of, they get it from Facebook, they get it from Twitter, they get it from the newspaper on their doorstep, they get it from TV, they get it from, you know, big portals, they get it from boutique news blog sites as well. So, you know, it's a little overwhelming to, to decide where you're going to go. Uh, one exercise you might do, just for the heck of it, is you might look at companies that are similar to yours and see, you know, how are they, how is their news being broadcast? Because you probably are coming in here and thinking, you know, I'm starting widget company A, and, uh, you know, I, I know that widget company C has been around for a while, and they're getting some attention, and how, how did they do that? And, you, you, frankly, there's no, no, there's no harm in following the course of where their news came from. You know, I have a little bias, and that is I think that a lot of the big stories about technology and other news originates with the mainstream media. If you follow back all the clicks and links, 
you'll come back probably to a newspaper, right, one of the big newspapers or a wire service or something like that eventually. The smaller news sites will also surface those. So if you want to be really efficient, you know, I, you know, Mike's talking about the New York Times and stuff. You know, they get millions and millions of pitches a day. Go for it. You have like a 1% chance of ever getting anything in the New York Times. If something gets in the New York Times, though, there's so many of these other secondary and tertiary news sites that are following and copying and repeating and aggregating the news, you have a really good magnification effect. You have that with us, too, frankly. You know, you get a story in the Seattle Times. Uh, we have a pretty big reach. Our stuff goes out on wire services. You know, if I, if I write a sexy story, it gets run all the way from, you know, Florida to Alaska to, you know, Los Angeles to Maine or internationally. And the sites like uh, Dig and Techneme and things like that and Reddit and all the aggregation sites, they'll pick, you know, they're watching us and they're kind of scooping up things and they're looking for where the buzz is. So if you get one well-placed shot at a big enough news organization, you know, it'll reverberate across the web as well. So, you know, think about this a little bit and I, I, I sort of sit back and go back to my original message there is, you know, one of your best tools is your mind to figure out you know, and your, your eyes be observant, figure out where you're going to go. But since you're here and you want to hear from us, you're probably interested in reaching the local news outlets, and your best tool there is your telephone and, and your feet, frankly. Feel free to give any of us a call. You know, I don't know about Mike, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> you know, our contact information is available. You can call us, you can email us. You know, our con if you don't have our contact information, you know, Google will help you there. We're all pretty. and. Send us a note, give us a call, send, no problem, reach out and ask. Uh, you have a, it's a long shot, frankly, nowadays to get things written. Uh, I get maybe 100 to 200 pitches a day. And I, I pretty much spend my day saying no to people. So, you know, and there's only so much space in the, blo in, in the newspaper, there's only so much space on the web and only so much time in my week for me to write things. So really it's a selection process, kind of a curation process. If you think about what we really do, you know, I don't know about John, because those guys work their butt off over at GeekWire, but really we kind of select the things that we think are the most important and present them to our audience. And the audience sees value in that selection, curation is the cool new word for it, but they see, they appreciate that and we provide this service. So, uh, maybe I'm jumping on to the next question. That fall off pretty hard. Okay, but it, so yeah. th think about that a little bit and, and how you're gonna kind of cut through all that cloud. So follow up to Briar there. So 100 to 200 pitches a day seems ridiculous to me. I mean, 100 to 200 emails a day, period, is hard to handle. 100 to 200 pi pitches is crazy. How do you decide which of those 100 to 200 pitches to go through? To me, one obvious filter is like, which of these are coming from PR people and which of them are coming from like the people actually doing the work? Most of them are from PR people. You know, you get on lists, it's just like spam, frankly. <laughs> Exactly, and, and you filter it out. You know, I gotta say apps, you know, everybody likes to read an app story, fun apps, great, you get a lot of traffic when you write an app story, but you know how many apps there are being generated every day? And, and you know, the key to succeeding if you're an app developer is getting attention, you know, and, if, and not everybody gets into John Gruber's blog. I've only been in there once when he called me an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> you go through the back door, I guess. You know. <laughs> I did. I got a huge amount of traffic. Completely spiked. <laughs> I, I don't get as many pitches as Briar, although I am, like I said, kind of new on the beat. But um, I would say, though, aside from the time you have to spend filtering through them all, it's probably somewhat easy because, frankly, most pitches just flat suck. They're formulaic. They're about things that are not interesting. And, you know, somebody went through a handbook and said, make sure you tell them there's some kind of trend that it's tapping into and it's a thing that's coming out now and you can have the exclusive, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know... It sucks that, yeah, I, I, you know, it's so, it's easy in that way because the, the, there's not that much good stuff out there. There's a lot of people who need and want attention. I would say back to Mike's story about the John McCain thing. You know why that blew up? Your guy's reaction when you heard it, right? It was interesting, it was authentic, it was real. It wasn't some, I mean, it was kind of contrived, right? But, <laughs> but it wasn't completely, you know. The, it was opportunistic. Yeah, yeah, but the, you know, the, the effect was an actual real thing that happened and was funny and interesting and that you would want to tell. Now, you can't make John McCain use your graphic off, pull your graphic off your server, you know, so. But, you know, there, there are things, I don't know, there's insights as an entrepreneur that you have. There are things that are out there on the scene that are, um, 
you know, that are authentic, interesting, real stories and not contrived kind of, hey, I have an app. I, I'll tell you what, everybody has an app. You know what's news? When Facebook didn't have an app. Yeah. Until, what, like last week, so. <laughs> um, so along those lines, I mean, there are things you can manufacture. So, you know, these, these, these um, good, good ones are rare, but they do happen. I mean, there was a Seattle company, Giant Think Well, that filmed a video of themsel themselves giving out cheeseburgers on the Am Amazon campus, trying to coerce developers into leaving Amazon and join joining Giant. No, 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 no. Cheeseburger, the cheeseburger oh, network right. gave away cheeseburger. They gave away, that. they gave away cats. Oh, cats. Okay, perfect. Cats, cheeseburgers. Right. Whatever it was, John picked it up. Um, so, it was so, funny. Humor. Yeah. Don't don't underestimate humor. And, and just following up on what, what Kurt was saying here, too. I mean, it's like, yeah, everyone has an app, but everyone also has a story. And I think that's what people forget. It's like, just because you have an app doesn't mean there's a cool story there. I mean, and it kind of speaks to what Mike's talking about. That was a cool, funny, interesting story. And people are going to bite on that. So you got to be... Strate even now with Briar getting 200 pitches and the thousands of emails that we all get on a daily basis, you gotta be more interesting, more authentic. Think of through your story a little bit more than just getting a press release and shooting it out to us. I mean, yeah, I bite on those occasionally when there's real news there, but for the most part it is. It's deleting most of that stuff. But somebody who comes up with giving away cats on the Amazon campus because of the recruiting challenge, yeah, I might bite. Um, two two separate unrelated things on that. There are, um, I think when you're when you're pitching a reporter, you need to kind of get inside their minds a little bit. I think when these guys write stories, um, these guys are now accountable for how many page views these stories get. I don't think reporters used to be accountable for the actual how many people actually read their stories. So when you pitch somebody like John, one of the first things that's going to go through his head, I'm thinking, is uh, am I going to be the source of record on this story? Right. So if I write this story. Are all the other blogs going to link to me because I wrote this story? Right? Isn't that kind of an important thing? Like, you don't want to be, you don't, if you can help it, you don't want to be like one of 50 people regurgitating the same press release. You want to be the one who asks the extra questions of the founder, who has all the extra information that other people link to. And so give, give, them, give them that sort of reason to write about you. The second thing I want to mention is just another example of somebody pulling off a really great publicity stunt was this company called Nosh.me, um, which, which uh, develops kind of like a food rating app. They, you know, one, one, one weekend they went out to this field in Utah and they filmed this, like, commando scene for their 404 page. So does everybody know what a 404 page is? It's like, you know, when you go to a web uh, uh, address that doesn't exist, you get a 404 page. Most websites just says file not found, page not found, screw, screw you. Um, these guys filmed, like, a full cinematic video of, like, commandos going out and, like, trying to find a page. And it was <laughs> so well done that it got picked up all over the place, got picked up on Daring Fireball, got picked up on TechCrunch, that wrote a really negative post about it. Um, Alexia, who's usually very um, sort of, um, I don't know, I like the way she writes, and she's usually on top of these things, but she actually gave it a very, very negative kind of spin to it. Like, why are these startup guys wasting their time going out into a field in commando fatigues for a 404 page? Shouldn't be, they be making sure that their app works and this and that? And it's like, you just, you just missed the point. You're writing about them. That's why they did it. <laughs> You know, and I, I would, I would, I would just say, those those kinds of gimmicks are very hard to pull off. I mean, I have to say, I've received ten or twenty of you know pitches that include gimmicks, and they they totally fall flat. They don't work. Yeah. Most of the time, I would say the basics is, you know, we're really busy. So if in a very short time you can tell us the really key bits of information, what's the total market size? You know, who are your key competitors, and and what's your key advantage. What, what is it that you have that nobody else has? If you can say that really quickly in, you know, four sentences, that's kind of the bottom line, and then we can follow up. But mo very often you get these long pitches, and, and you never get to the point, of, and, and you're likely to be ignored. I want to add one more thing, too. Sorry. Um, because I, I don't want everybody rushing out here, although it could be funny, uh, experiment and trying to come up with the craziest, you know, commando cheeseburger cat. Publicity stunt. <laughs> well, it could be interesting. Um, it, another way of of generating interest is to just be. I don't know. It sounds dumb, but just be real or be authentic. I've one story that I've told before is a version of before PopCap Games got bought by EA. Okay, they did the thing where they they went to New York and they said we're thinking about filing for an IPO and and went around and did kind of a pre road show and talked to lots of investors and lots of press, and they got a week of just 
really great press coverage. Um, if you noticed it, it was in outlet after outlet after outlet. They didn't have to really promise anyone an exclusive. And every story was a little bit different. And how did they do that? You could see it. If you, if you read all the pieces, you could tell how it got there. The CEO and the co-founder sat down with these people and just you know answered pretty much all of the questions that they could. They, they gave one, one blogger said, oh, can I see your financials? He said, yeah, here's the slides that we've been showing on our roadshow. You know, it's just selected financials. Most companies would go, well, we don't disclose that. While they're in, across the street on Wall Street showing everybody in the world. Why? You know, why not? And so they got a great story there. Um, somebody else interviewed him later and said, what do you think about Zynga? Semi-controversial gaming startup worth a ton of money. And the co-founder, John Vici, you know, normally a CEO would say, well, you know, we're here to talk about us. Right? You know, and Zynga's great, but what we do. And he said, well, you know, I used to not like them. Uh, and I didn't think they would succeed. Um, and now I've changed my mind, and I, I think they'll be successful. But the question to me is, though, is how long will they be around? And, and kind of this long, nuanced, perfectly reasonable answer. He honestly didn't say anything that crazy. That's what everybody kind of thinks, probably. Um, but you know, instead of just throwing up a wall and kind of retreating into your talking points, he just said something totally, I don't know, nothing that crazy. And, these guys did this over and over and over, and they just got great press coverage. It was a pleasure to read, really, on my part. Um, so be authentic, you know, um, as much as you can, anyway. I think, you know, I'd also suggest thinking about your timing. Uh, you know, my comment about 120, 100 to 200 pitches a day, you know, it's a little strong. Right now, uh, we're entering conference season, we're entering holiday season, so I'm getting all these gadget things saying, are you doing a holiday this, are you doing a holiday that? and. Uh, uh, we, it gets really bad as we approach the big trade shows, like the Consumer Electronics Show. You sign up for one of those shows, it's just a spam generator, and uh, we've got a CTIA wireless show going on, and there's a lot of wireless news happening. So, you know, stay away from those big waves. I, 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 that would be my advice, too, is think about that. <coughs> and uh, are there big, huge industry events? I think that the mindset is always, well, let's try and piggyback on that, because there's going to be a lot of attention. Well, if you're going to be at the show and you want to set up an appointment, that's, that's one thing. But if you're just trying to piggyback on that from afar, I don't think it'll really work. And uh, frankly, the, we're all so overwhelmed right now that you know it's a bad time when, when, when something like that's going on. Or if, of course, if Apple's doing something or some big events happening, I mean, you, you, you know what's going on if you pay attention. And so be, be thoughtful about those kind of things. And also be thoughtful, I think, about what the person you're approaching does. And you know, the biggest, you know, screw up, I think, by PR people is to not know who they're approaching or not know what the person writes about, to just come off, you know, off the wall with something like, what the hell, I've never even touched that in my whole career. I will never write about that in my life. And I'm covering Microsoft's earnings live as we speak. So, you know, <laughs> you, you, pay, you know, pay, pay attention and spend a little bit of time before you approach one of us. I think that that, that was, will do more than any strategizing, it's just timing. It really is, a lot of times it's just luck. You know, when are you gonna catch us? When does it look like our news is slowing down? You know, pay attention to what we're writing. That'll, that'll give you a sense of the timing. That'll give you a sense of what we do. That'll give you a sense of the stories that we're interested in. And it doesn't take a whole, a whole lot of effort for you to do that. So there's an, we've been talking a lot about the inbound that comes in that we have to consume on a daily basis, but that's not actually what I like to deal with on a lot of basis, and to piggyback a little bit of, on what Kurt was saying, what we like to do is go out and find your story and find those interesting nuggets that you may not even be ready to talk about. And that's when we get kind of excited. And um, so so those are stories, and that kind of puts, that creates another interesting dynamic in terms of how you manage PR. And that's why I really like what Kurt was saying about the PopCap guys, and I've interviewed them a bunch of times, and it, it, he's absolutely right. They're great. They're transparent. They tell their story. They answer your questions. It's the one thing I hate about dealing with Microsoft, and I'm glad my colleague Todd Bishop deals with them because I, I, I just can't do it. I mean, they're programmed. They have their talking points, and they don't go off message, and they stick to it, and it's, it's not fun. I, don't, I can't imagine it's fun for the person who's in the interview who's providing the content, and it's not fun for the reporter who's trying to make a story out of it. So being authentic, especially when we've gone out to proactively find that story that we may have uncovered something. And, and a lot of people get scared and they retreat and they're like, I think that's maybe the first instinct, like, oh, a reporter called, I can't say anything. Or maybe that's the media training, I don't know. But it's actually, I think, almost uh, in your better interest to just come straight out and, and 
proactively say what's going on. I mean, I remember covering Newsvine. I mean, Newsvine happened to be in the Seattle PI building at the time, and I went. It's like, well, Newsvine, that sounds like a tech startup. Interesting. I went down there, and I saw it one day. I saw their logo, and I went down. And I uninvited. Uh, uninvited. I knocked on the door, and I said, what are you guys doing in here? <laughs> and, and to me, that's what journalists get really excited about. And so there are all sorts of stories that are out there that we like to pursue that you might not be quite ready to tell, but just be there and be, you're better off having the relationship and, tr and just reacting to what, because I think this is hard for startups and entrepreneurs and executive types. They're so used to running their companies and being in control of something. When a reporter comes in, it's hard for them to say, uh, yeah, yeah, we're not, yeah, they want to control the situation. Well, it doesn't really work that way, and it really pisses off the journalist and reporter when they say, no, we're not, we're controlling this, you're not, because that's just not the way it's worked in media historically. And that's... Um, and if you don't take the opportunity right there, you may not get the opportunity again. That's right, that's a good point. I mean, I we, never come back to yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've, I've had situations where I've talked to scientists, and they've said, well, you know, we can't quite talk to you right now about it, but, you know, come back to us in, in two months. Well... You know, you may not you may not get that other opportunity. You you, you have to be ready. Uh, and the other thing about it, I think, is you have to be ready. You should be always ready to to explain in layman's terms what your business model is, what your technology is, and and frequently what what we find is is we get we we're we're, we're given to an engineer who who can't quite explain in 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 in, in easy language and. Uh, Often, and, if, and, and they want then to see the copy, we're not going to show the copy. So you have to be able to explain it in, in, in simple enough terms that we're going to be able to get it and reproduce it, you know, uh, clearly. You, you know, um, another thing is the, the most interesting thing about your company, frankly, is probably you, uh, more than your stuff. Uh, you know, if, if you want to get us interested in your story, tell us about you and, what, you know, what's your interesting life story? Because really... You know, a lot of companies, you know, how, how, what, what makes your company different than the next company, the, the next guy down the street that's trying to, to start something? A lot of times the best story is about the person behind the company, and at least that'll get us interested because we like to write stories about people, frankly, more than we like to write stories about your financing or your new feature or your new this or that. And, and uh, you know, that's what people want to read, too. They want to know who, you know, it's the who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, of course, but who is really the thing that, that makes your story interesting. And you, you can't tell that reading the business page of our paper or other things. You, you would never know. But we're always looking for the good, the good human interest story. So keep that in mind and, and be prepared to share a little bit about that, too. When you, when you start sharing the story of your company, you know, be, think about what you're going to share about yourself because we're going to ask. You know, where are you from? What makes you, why, you know, why are you interesting? What, you know, what's special about you? And also, you know, that's always... That, with business stories, that's sort of the most exciting part usually is there's somebody who's got an idea, they've got a passion for something, they're creating something new, you know, they've got the, the spirit and the passion to go out and do it and try it and change, you know, their life and change the community and maybe create opportunity for other people and make other people's lives better with their jobs. So really that's the essence of the story that we're always looking for. So you might think, you know, help, help us find that essence and it makes our job easier. And uh, you know, really, you all you all have interesting companies, and just because we don't have time to get to it, it doesn't mean that we don't think it's cool that you're doing these things and that we're not we're not interested. It's there's a difference between interest and capability for for covering the companies too. Yeah, that that's a great point. I've I've got a really good example of that occurring to me here recently. There was a company. It's an online backup company based here in in the Seattle area. And, you know, online backup, reco data recovery, it's not the sexiest stuff, and there's a ton of competition in that space. But I asked the guy, um, so where did this idea come from? How did you, because I always try to ask entrepreneurs with that, that question, because I always think, it, as Breyer was saying, it always kind of sparks this really interesting concept. You know, where did the idea c initially come from? And, and the guy said, well, my house got hit by lightning. And it knocked out all my computers. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And he didn't, you know, he didn't really share too much more about it. And, but I kept coming back to it. I was like, well, where do you live? Where is your house? You know? And so you start getting the, it's in Woodenville. And he's like, well, what would your wife say? And it's like, he started going off about how his wife was really worried about losing all their photo albums and all this stuff. And so that ended up being, of course, you know, the lead and the nugget that got me into this story on a pr pretty dense topic. And I, so I just wanted to piggyback on what Breyer said there is, 
it's just a really way of having your story honed and to kind of follow the lead of the reporter sometimes because they're going to the, if you follow their lead, they're going to take you, and if that, that was a better story, and more people read it because I was able to have this really interesting anecdote rather than just saying, blah, 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 company is in the, it has this new online backup technology. So it, it helps to kind of follow the lead of the reporter and listen to them guided by their questions, and I think that's what the PopCap guys were doing too. I think, I think that's all really good advice. I do think you have to be careful not to lead with yourself um, if, you can, if you can help it. Um, I think these days there are so many entrepreneurs that have already accomplished things or people with great degrees from Stanford or whatever where it's like you don't want to lead with here's how great I am and now here's my product. I mean I think what got John interested in the, pro in, in the story to begin with was oh my god there's this big successful company that used to be in Seattle. And I think the, the, the phrase follow the reporter's lead is an important one there. I think, I think once you've got the, the reporter interested in what your product actually is Exposing who you are as a person and how you and, and how you how you how you brought things to that point is is a great way to kind of make sure that the that the story is you know written in a way that is that 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 strikes a chord with people. Um, I also I mean I think that's pretty generous. Everybody's company's interesting. Um, <laughs> I think that's generous too. Uh, there's so many companies out there. I mean, really, there's well, so. Subway okay. But, yeah. you know. I mean, I, maybe your company is interesting. I hope it is. Um, but I really, really think we are getting to the point where we have so many clones of clones of clones yeah. um, out there. And you can't just assume that your company is interesting and that your product is interesting, especially if it's the X of Y. I hate people who are like, oh, always explain your company as I'm the X of Y. Um, I'm the I'm the turntable.fm for Gregorian chants. You know, like I, I, I hate I, I hate explaining my company in terms like that. I like to explain my company in more original terms. Um, and so, you know, don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because you think your idea is is, is interesting that other people are going to automatically think it's interesting. And a lot of this is getting to this is kind of like a, a macro idea that I, I think about doing my job. There are things that I have to do and things that I want to do. Which of those do you think that? has a much more readable outcome, right? So what are things I have to do? It's like Briar said, sitting on the Microsoft earnings call, you know, utility journalism. I've done tons of it in my life. Um, you know, there are breaking stories that are happening out there that you've got to be on. Those are actually exciting a little bit. You know, Mike Arrington, the blogger, uh, unpaid blogger now, um, broke the other night as we were eating dinner. Um, that swipe was getting bought by Nuance, and we all raced home and tried to confirm it, you know, and we're watching, does he have it yet? Does he have it yet? Does she have it yet? So I had to do that, and I was annoyed because I was at dinner, but it was somewhat exciting. Um, now, are, what are things that I want to write about, right? Like, th there's a lot of effort put into, in the PR world, into generating fake urgency, right? Um, embargoes are, I mean, we, I could talk for an hour about that, and it's really inside baseball, but they're horribly over abused and, and used as leverage against other people and made so people think that they have an exclusive and all these kinds of things. You know, it's this false scarcity that's applied to really just standard product announcements. That's lame. You know, make me want to write about it. Don't make me try and feel like I have to do it. Because um, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's not a long play, right? Like these guys were saying, you know, you, you, you want to keep in mind the, the long con too, right? Like, you know, have a relationship with people. And if it comes down to it down the road, you know, God forbid, but there might be some bad news about your company. And you know, if you have good relationships with people, it's just easier for you to handle when the bad news comes, all of those things. And I'm not saying, and I'm not even trying to hint that people are you know, going to be vindictive if you've burned them before or anything like that. But you know, having good relationships, I'm not. I mean, I think there are probably some individual blogger type people out there who do that in the world. But I mean, none of these guys do. And um, it's just having good relationships, just like anything, is better. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I would say is if you are a plain vanilla type company, which there are obviously where it's really hard to sort of stand out, um, you know, one thing we like to we like to do is to look at broader trends. And for example, say you know digital marketing, there's a ton of little companies out there doing digital marketing, but you know early this year we 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 decided to pull them together and do a story on on who's doing interesting stuff on, 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 on iPhones, on, on smart, smartphones. And so there's a way, a company that we might not have otherwise have written about you know, by itself, 
becomes interesting in the context of all the different you know tactics and strategies that are being used through the through this medium to 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 advertise. I wonder. Um, I, I hate to cut this this conversation off because it's really really interesting, but um, we want to give our audience um, a chance to ask some questions too. And it looks like we've got some people who would like to ask some questions. So if it's all right, I will switch gears. Um, really, the questions that I had, you've, you've discussed those very fully. Um, importance of relationships, the elements of a good story. Um, you know, how does a pitch come to your attention? I mean, those are, I think, all things that are important to the audience. Um, so if it's all right, what I'd like to do, I know we have a microphone. Muriel has a microphone. I'd like to try it with one microphone for the audience and leave the two up here. Um, for the panel, and we'll see how that works, and we'll kind of go one side of the room, other side of the room. So we'll start there, since Muriel has standing on that side of the room. And uh, you might have to hold that microphone fairly close to your mouth to, to get, pick it up. All right, uh, first of all, thank you. Very interesting. Um, are you picking it up? Nope. Now are you picking it up? All right. Um, since you guys touched on this briefly, but I didn't hear an answer from all of you, um, could you, uh, for those who it's applicable to, give me an idea of how large your reach is in your audience and who, who you kind of target? So like, if I, uh, who's, your, who's your target audience and how big are they? Our Sale Times has a, you know, the weekend papers, you know, 400,000 paid or so, 500,000, I can't remember exactly. The daily is like 200-ish thousand and our website's about 10 million a month. I don't like to think about that. I don't, frankly, I don't want to chase clicks. I don't want to think about making money for the paper. I want to just write good stories and serve the readers. I, I, among all these people, have the luxury of being in kind of old school newsroom where there's a wall between the business side and the news side, and I don't, that I try not to let that stuff influence me. But so, but you know, obviously, the biggest concentration of our readers is Seattle, Metro, East Side. You know, it's people who make maybe a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year. Average age is probably sixty. You know, but it, it reaches from everybody, from you know Steve Ballmer to a little old lady in Lake City. So we're we're all over the place. I mean, really, it's shotgun when you come to a mainstream media outlet. We're not. I don't. I don't. I like. To, and so when I write stories, I like to think about all those different people reading about it. Everybody from my five-year-old who I have to explain the story to in the morning all the way up to, you know, grandma who doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about. So, it, it, you know, it's everybody. It's the people you see around us. I don't want to, like I said, I'm kind of the new guy, so I don't want to get fired talking about uh, traffic. So I'll skip that part. <laughs> I'll dodge your question. This is a great press conference. Um, uh, one thing I will say is that our economy is a national network of sites in different cities, right? That, so we cover innovation in Boston, in San Francisco, San Diego, Seattle, a couple other places. Um, and our audience is, as far as the type of people, it's, it tends to be more of a, it's less consumer -y and more of a business leader thing. So s similar in an online sense to like a, a business magazine uh, type thing. And actually the co-founders used to work at uh, one of them used to work with Leslie um, and also used to work at uh, MIT Technology Review. Um, and so one thing that you'll find, because we have a national network, is that even though for our site we're here based in Seattle, is that VCs, business leaders, competitors, whomever in Boston, San Francisco, San Diego, you know, people will, will tap into that through our network, uh, read it on our national site. So. We really embrace the concept. I know John and Todd do this too, of, of trying to take the local, make it national, make it global, um, rather than trying to make people have to level up through different types of media and get, you know, on the national publication. So, uh, we do five to seven million uniques a month at Newsvine, and we do forty to fifty million uniques at MSNBC.com, and they're all over the place. So GeekWire is a niche-oriented technology news site based here in Seattle. We uh, cater to the influencers in the technology community from venture capitalists and entrepreneurs up to people who are in executive positions at, at Microsoft, Amazon, Expedia, Real Networks, what have you. Uh, our audience is, you know, we're six months old. I'll, I'll, I'll plead the fifth along with Kurtz. And I was waiting for him to share his numbers so I would share mine so I know where they're at. 
we have a good healthy competition, uh, which is I would say one thing that's great about the technology news scene here in, in the Northwest is there's there's actually a lot of us. I mean, we could have filled this panel out with probably five or ten other folks actually, and so. You know, it's it's nice to have that sort of relationship with uh, with folks. The the metric that we look at a lot uh, is the uh, is Tech Meme, uh, the Tech Meme leaderboard. It's it's a, a, a national news aggregation site, and it basically ranks uh, the top uh, top technology news sites in the country. And we're I was just looking it up and seeing if I could pull it up, but it fluctuates depending where we are. But we're about a top twenty five site on there, um, and so we're pretty proud of that. And uh, Based, in, in part because it's driven and driven by uh, actual news coverage and scoops, and that's something that we pride ourselves on. We just don't regurgitate other people's press releases. We try to get out there and tell stories and break news, and um, that's kind of our shtick. Does that answer your question? What else? I would, would, felt like there was another part to it that I missed. Me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think it gets back to what Briar was saying earlier. I mean, if you uh, if you want to reach kind of um, a more of a niche audience, I think there are places like Xconomy and GeekWire. If you want to go kind of a more broad-based br uh, approach, there are things like, well, there's the real broad-based, broad like, like MSNBC, uh, which is a partner of, I should disclose, is a partner of, of GeekWire, and we always love when they pick up our stories, and because that drives nice traffic to us, uh, which is a good, you know, kind of a national media outlet that we can have at our ready. But yeah, if, if you want to reach to a more general consumer, as Briar was saying earlier, that, you know, your neighbors and the community banker and what have you, there, there are things to think about there. And then I'll let Leslie speak on, in terms of uh, his audience and what they're, what, you know, his pitch. Yeah, we're we're no more narrowly. We're we're Washington State uh, business executives, CEOs, probably you know uh, circulation you know hundred thousand unique or so, but the print circulation is more in the twenty three thousand range around there. Oh, question back there, and then we'll yeah. hello. And this guy. And this guy. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Chris Lyerly, serial entrepreneur. My latest startup is uh, Phytelligence, doing smart plant technology out of WSU. Uh, John uh, mentioned uh, press releases, the first person on the panel to do so. My question is, is there still a role for the traditional press release? What should we do with them? Should we do them? Um, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Thank you. I think I'm a little... Uh go against the grain on this probably compared to some of the other panelists here but I actually like press releases but I like them uh, a press release can take many forms for me basically what I want you to do in order to make my job easier is to boil down what the new kind of what Leslie was saying earlier boil down your news nuggets of what you're gonna provide me into a written statement that you're providing to me two to three days in advance about what the news is uh, it could be a, in the form of a blog post, it can be just a few sentences, it can be an actual press release, I don't care what it is, but I just like it written down so I can process it, put it on my calendar, know what's coming up, I may get back to it. It's essentially a triaging process. And if something is written down for me that I can put into my system, I'm a lot better off and much more efficient than just uh, the alternative. I would agree with that. I mean, it, it can take many forms, there's still a role for it. I mean, you know, the, the foundational point is the one we spent an hour blabbing about before, which is have some actual news and not just, you know, um, something that, that you're kind of dressing up because it's, well, we're, we're time to go get some publicity now. And so, you know, we've got some kind of fake vanity metrics that we've made up and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, have something there. If, if you have the time, and not everybody has the time, I think it makes sense to have maybe, you know, two different press releases. One that's really aimed for that niche trade publication that wants to have, you know, all the details. If you're, you know, about, well, I can't remember what it was, smart buildings, is that what it was? Um, uh, you know, the, the, this, all the detail that an article that covers nothing but smart buildings is going to want to know. And then, you know, a more general interest type of, of, of uh, press release, which will get the key points of you know, why, why somebody who's not generally covering smart buildings would care about this. I mean, that's, that's, that would be what, what we would want. Yeah, I, I think you, you don't have to call a press release to, you, you know, don't uh, pitch in an email 
or even a phone call is a press release, really. You know, if you put the information in, a, in an email, put it in the body of the email, don't have an, an attachment necessarily, because that's just forcing us to go through another step or two to get to the information that you're trying to get us. You, you, and speak, you know, talk about your company and when you approach us, like you might describe it to a friend or a family member or something like that, too. You know, what's interesting, it's your elevator pitch, basically. And uh, I, one thing that's also helpful, I think, is if you take that, your company's story and repurpose it and put it in, your, you know, you'll probably have a web presence. I imagine anybody who starts a company now sets up a web presence at some point. You know, that's your opportunity to communicate directly to people and to publish your own story without having to go through us and trying to get our get us to do it for you. So, you know, make it your about us part of your website. And it's amazing to me how many companies don't take advantage of that. They set up websites. I mean, you get a free practice from and they don't bother to put any information about them. And they, I think they think they're being stealthy and that's cool and stuff like that. But you know, take advantage of that because that that is an extension of your press release. If, if you send something to us, we think it's interesting make sure you have your URL in there or your website because we'll go to the website and if we go to the website and you just have some cute logo saying coming soon, you know, you've lost us there. So take advantage of that about us opportunity. Frankly, you're publishing your story to the world at that point. So put your press release right there. One of my little pet peeves too is when companies don't bother to put up assets and stuff. So a uh, picture, assets being like say a picture or maybe a biography. I talked about how we're interested in who you guys are. I don't, it's amazing to me how companies don't bother to say who's behind the company, you know, who's running the company, who the founders are. And I, I understand there's privacy and competitive things and stuff like that, but just, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, how do I contact you? You know, where's the, what's the address of the company? Even that is helpful to people. Maybe you're trying to avoid sales calls and things like that, but, but you know, as you're developing your press release or if you're just really starting your company or thinking about this outreach stuff, Really, you can multi-purpose this stuff. You repurpose it and use it a lot of different ways. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I, I got a great example of this today from a, a company here in town by the name of Big Oven. They're an online recipe company. The CEO's name is Steve Merch. He emailed me, hi, John, wanted to let you know that a few minutes ago we here at Big Oven pushed Menu Planner live to beta. So then he goes on. This is the CEO of the company, which is another good lesson. It's not some PR person that's pitching me. He ha has a one-to-one -one dialogue going with me already about this news that they have. He's pitching me, he lays out four or five uh, elements of what's cool about this. Drag and drop recipes onto a calendar, click a button to generate a grocery list for any date range automatically sorted by aisle. Kind of cool, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I keep reading. He, he then provides a link of their blog post that they've already written, provides more, more uh, information about what they're doing, which sends me to images, which gets to Breyer's point, we're now always looking for images and artwork to display what your technology is or who you are, so headshots are always good. Don't have to do a follow-up, just include it. Uh, then it says, here's the demo video of us, of, of us showing it off on the web, YouTube video, which I ended up embedding into our story on it. It was perfect. It was perfect. It, had, it, it was short. And then, since I already had the CEO of the company emailing me about it, I had a couple other questions. I was like, wow, this, how are you getting the aisle information on the groceries? How are you doing that? I was curious. So I just shot him an email. I was like, how does that work? And so then we had a dialogue. So I had the quote from, I had you know, an interview essentially via email, quotes from him, the YouTube video. It was, and it just came together. The one thing it didn't have the purpose, I wish I had a little bit better art. So if you go onto GeekWire, you'll see. And I just ran out of time. I was gonna follow up with him and say, hey, can you send me over a little bit piece of better art that, to illustrate what this looks like? It was one missing piece, but other than that, it was perfect. I, I would just highly recommend following that path. <laughs> and I, I would just second the point about, about the art. I mean, headshots are good, but even better if you can use, ha actually hire a professional photographer and get some really good art, I, it'll, it'll take you a long ways. And even better if it's a, if it's a complicated technology, if you can hire somebody or to, to do a good graphic that really explains well. I mean, it goes a long way towards explaining your technology. That's, that's also huge. There's a, there's a guy in town named Lee Lefevre, a friend of mine, who um, that's what his company does, is they make, they, they make short videos explaining products. Um, they, did the, they did one of them for Google. What was it for? Do you remember? It was a lot of them for Google. One of them is like really famous, though. I forgot what it was. Yeah, I forgot. I don't know if it was Wave. Did they do it for Wave? Uh, was it Wave? 
thought it, I thought it was a product that people actually used. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it might have been like, yeah, they, they, they've done it. They've done a ton of them though, um, and it, they do it for a reasonable fee as well. So like, if you need if you need a, a really nice demo done, um, that's that's approachable for people. You know, don't be afraid to call um, your local experts in town. Lee Lefevre. And one, one very last point on that one. Sorry, that was a long one about press releases. Please be very clear. I, I don't burn people on this, but at some point, something really juicy is going to come my way, and I'm going to have to. When you email a reporter, everything is on the record and reportable that moment, unless you say, I have something to tell you, but it's hold for release. Do you agree? The number of email pitches I get every day where it says, hey, we're announcing something on Tuesday. Guess what? You just announced it. You just announced it. And if it was important enough for me that I felt like it had to go out, I would go out now. Um, and if I could, you know, if it was, I felt like it was time to take that step. Um, most, as it turns out, most of the people who do that don't have really super important news that I need to burn the relationship. So um, <laughs> there's something there. But, um, you know, I don't, I, you know what, like, we're not friends and we're not enemies, but I, there's, if there's anything I don't, care about in this world it's your product release schedule it doesn't I mean I I aggressively do not care about that <laughs> you know to every fiber of my being like um, and so you know just be clear just say hey we have something it's interesting do you look at stuff on embargo some people don't yeah sure send it my way you know that means I won't report on it until you know we've agreed to this thing if you send me something and say hey here's my embargo press release you know. <laughs> Yeah, I hate that too. Uh, and the challenge there, and I've gotten into this situation, is somebody sends you information under embargo and you have already found out about it through another channel. You know, this has happened on venture deals numerous occasions for me. And uh, it's just like, well, I'm kind of already have been talking to people about this and you're putting me under embargo. It just doesn't work, so. Dennis, I think um, you I have your hand up. Should I wait for the microphone? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, coming. It's coming. It's coming. As fast as you can. I'm Dennis Dubois, and uh, first I want to say that this is the kind of dynamic, information-packed session that makes a former chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum extremely proud. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with, uh, you've talked about news outlets and you've talked about blogs, and sandwiched in between there are a seemingly growing number of sites that uh, self-identify as news, written by non-journalists. Uh, a mix of people trying to be the next Huffington Post, perhaps, or trying to may, make millions off of advertising. How, how would you advise a startup who either wanted to approach those or was being approached by those sorts of outlets? I think your first gate would be if they asked you for money. Yeah, to, <laughs> uh, really, seriously, you, you know, I, my father-in-law is a magician, and he's always trying to advertise and promote his magic thing. It's, you know, it's neat. But, you know, he gets these most amazing pitches from from things like that, saying, "Yeah, you know, you know, we'll we'll publicize your little one dude magic program for thousand dollars a month." You know, and and the there's so a lot of them are scams around Google and saying, "Hey, you know, let us let us put your company on our site so that Google will notice you, uh, uh, so that you'll get rank high in search engines and things like that." You know, I think that's a, a rat hole, and I think it's expensive, and I think that you can do a lot better than to hand over the money that you haven't even made yet from your company to, to do that. You know, use your money to build your company and reach out, you know, build something interesting that then becomes newsworthy. So I, that, that's just one little tip is what, but on the other hand, there are lots of sites that are always looking for content that don't ask for money that are just news sites. I think that's one place where you kind of say, is this a news site or is it something else? You know, news sites don't ask you for money. They want your story and they tell your story. So, so think about that. It's making it harder, though, frankly, because it's, it's muddling kind of what this panel does, which is real journalism. I mean, everyone up here tries to report the news and be independent journalists. And there, there is this rise of people that are just clouding the landscape. And it talks to, you know, speaks to kind of the business insider issue, which, you know, we've run into that multiple occasions where we have a good story. We've reported it out. We did the hard work on it. And they just suck it right in and re republish it. And it's, it's just not fair. It sucks. And all that is hurting the craft of journalism, unfortunately. And I'm hopeful, and I, I, I wouldn't have jumped into starting a new online publication if I didn't think that uh, if there was hope there and that we could, we could do something creative and innovative. But 
I guess what I would ask of everybody out there is a plea to like support those people that are actually trying to do it and do it right and let those other people do what they do. If I can twist it around too, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sites uh, and entities online that are news sites even though they don't identify as such. So Facebook for instance, you know, it's making itself over into the, your, your news site and uh, you can use those directly and take advantage of those and they, you know, they don't, they're not accosting you and asking you. But you might think about these different, wh wh where are people getting their news? And there are sites like Facebook, Twitter, and, and community sites. So you can, you, know, you, can, you can take advantage of those things and you can communicate yourself. For instance, uh, one famous blogger, a guy named Dave Weiner, had a software company in Silicon Valley. He had a little thing, announcement about his company and he tried uh, like mad to get every publication in the country to write about it. Nobody would write about it, nobody cared. It was like, okay, whatever, we don't care about your software company. He got so frustrated, he invented this technology for blogging, you know, that transmitted the, the RSS platform for blogging and he became, you know, like the first blogger basically. And he created this new platform that anybody can use to self-broadcast. And that's the platform that a lot of these new sites that you're talking about uh, are taking advantage of. But I think the moral of the story there is there are ways to get your story out there without having to go through a news site even. You can do it yourself. I might have slightly misunderstood the question, but I thought you were talking about kind of like hobbyists, like like not journalists, but like some some young you know, some young kid has a has a tech blog when they, they like to cover companies. Like is that worth uh, your time? Is that what you were or, or twenty young kids? Yeah, I would I would talk to all of them. I mean, why not? I mean, when TechCrunch, TechCrunch was the first, was the first uh, publication to write about us. Wait, were they first or were you first? on the door. Yeah, yeah, one and one A. Uh, but, but when we talked to Mike, he was a one-man shop. So it, it, it was lowercase TechCrunch back then. I mean, it was, it was no, they, 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 were, they had no sort of high profile at all. He just happened to find out about us and, you know, we, we made some time for him. So, you know, I think if you get the feeling that the person that you're talking, like you said, if you get the, per the feeling that the person talking to you wants something out of you, and especially money, obviously run the other way, but there are, there are plenty of niche, niche sites out there, niche blogs out there that, you I mean, you would be surprised who reads them. And it's all about getting that chain reaction. Yeah, I wouldn't pitch all of them. I, I, I would take a little bit of research and, and spend a little bit of time. And it doesn't take that much, but spend a little bit of time on it. Go back to their archive. Look at look at how many posts they're generating, look if they're doing kind of original work, look at their comment threads, see if there's some authentic voices that are actually commenting on stories. You can get a sense of the, the community there if you look at the comment threads. And, yeah. and, and I would do that, but you know, there's, there, yeah, there's some things that are out there that just aren't gonna be worth your time. Well, what do you think of, oh, wherever. Um, help a reporter. I've I've taken the time. It takes a lot of time to answer their specific. Good. Have you guys ever used that? Help a reporter. Any of those sites? You haven't heard of that? Twitter. No. Uh, no. It's H A R O. Help a reporter out or something, right? Mm -hmm. I've not used it. I am intrigued by it. I've used some of like the proto versions of that or previous kind of like attempts at it, which was like Profnet and those kind of things where you can essentially seed something that says, you know, and you've got a bunch of different kinds of experts who subscribe to it and says, hey, I'm looking at a, writing a story about X kind of national trend and I need a social scientist who can tell me about it. Right. Um, so I actually would like to use something like that um, a little more because especially when you've got a story that can scale up and fit into a bigger picture, those kind of things can be very useful as a reporter. I, I can't talk about the specifics because I've not used it. Well, I, I've answered a lot of those and you don't even find out if you're being used or not. They, they basically put out article ideas and say, if you have any expertise in this, please send us some information. I've written paragraphs and then yeah. haven't heard back from them. So I'm just yeah. wondering if you guys use them. Um, I will honestly say that I would like to use things like that more because it's it's just casting the net wider, uh, presuming that this, the sources are you know reliable and, and stuff. and. I mean, one thing that you're going to find, I would say, on that dynamic of not hearing back, it goes into a black hole, will it get used, is that is just a, a written down version of what happens in the interviewing process. You know, I might call on some big story 10 people and, and finally find the thing that's useful. And sometimes there's duplicate stuff. Somebody wrote something in a little, you know, nicer way or it just got to me first. And so, you know, don't take it personal, I guess. 
again, better than that might be what, what John Cook was talking about, comment threads. If you insert yourself in the conversation, if you know about something, you, you, you find an article that's talking about it, you go in there and you say something smart, you, you become you know, a commentator that people look at and they will look to you to, for, for, uh, for answers. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, and we really encourage that for people to just jump into the comments, comment threads. That that's helping a reporter out. I mean, we I feel as if I'm just kind of sparking the beginning of the conversation and just telling a part of the story. On every story I'm doing, there's always more to it, and you see that in the comment threads occasionally on GeekWire, where I've written something and it just there's just a this inflow. It's great. It's this inflow of information and people sharing additional insights, and I'm in there learning all the time. I mean. Before, when I was uh, covering technology and I was like covering the, the 1098 issue, the tax issue, I learned so much just through the comment threads back and forth, the really engaged, highly intelligent audience uh, talking about this issue. And so I, I totally agree with Leslie. I think there's a way to become a thought leader. You're kind of, it, this sounds like it's kind of a mass system and you're not sure whether you're getting recognition or not. There, there are ways to do that on, on highly trafficked uh, websites and news sites where you can have a profile picture and you can label that who you are and what you do and you can actually become a presence. And frankly, you know, we're reading our comment threads all the time. I'm actually developing more of a source relationship with those people and I, they're top of mind for me when I need to actually go and get information about that subject the next time. So there's a more public way to do that. Hi, um, my name is, I'm sorry, speaking there. This is a really odd looking microphone. Um, my name is Rebecca Wynn and um, I'm a former media relations assistant and reporter who's looking for work. Uh, that's why I came. Sorry, could you speak up just a little bit, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, my name is Rebecca Wynn and I'm a former media relations assistant and reporter who's looking for work. And I figured this would be a good forum to come to, especially since it's dealing with technology, which I have no experience with. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to. Um, but my question is, uh, technology seems, it is, it's a unique beat, and where is, where is the forum that you go to to put your ear to the ground? Is it exclusively uh, social media? You know how other beats, like say the police beat, you know, you hang up at the diner to talk to the cops, or you go to say the bar where all the politicians hang out. Where do you go to get those really good stories, those exclusives? Um, is it something like this, or is it more online, you know, Twitter? Um, and then I guess I have another question, um, just going back to, I hate to bring it up, press releases. Um, what percentage of your stories are actually coming from a pitch or a press release? Um, you know, you might not want to admit it, but when someone asked, you know, would you like us to stop sending you them, nobody said no. <laughs> You know, you, you, you do still want them. So um, I guess, you know, they are beneficial to you. I mean, I remember they were beneficial to me. They, they make your life a little bit easier. But um, yeah, I guess those are my two questions. I'll take the first part, which is how do we Thank find you. stories and where do you go to hang out to get the information? Uh, I get it all over the place, and that's why I come out to events like this. I, you know, I think the last time I was at, in this room, I started talking to a guy, and he came up to me, and he said, hey, I just moved my company. Kurt, you got onto that story, too. I think you beat me on that I one. Right you, did, you saw me interviewing him, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Admit it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you really? That night? Yeah, it was a good little story. He was talking about how he moved his company up here from uh, California because of the uh, affiliate tax issue yeah. down, in, down there. And it, it was a great little story. And so it, that was a funny one. We were competitive on that one. Uh, so that was an example. We just picked that up because it was a guy came up to us at an event. Um, I was at the WTIA Tech Northwest event today or, or uh, earlier this week, and there were just there were a plethora of good stories and was all over the map coming out of events. Speakers talking about various things and and Twitter always monitoring Twitter. There's so much story, so much story activity going on there. That it's incredible. It's almost intimidating to go on there as a as a reporter because you're going to find something interesting. Good old fashioned tips and sources are still the number one to get those big stories, those stories that are gonna matter, that get you up to the top of tech meme. And you know, we've had some of those this week. Uh, we've been tracking this Amazon locker phenomena here in the city where you can now get your packages delivered to a 7-Eleven. Those stories are coming in through kind of good old fashioned uh, 
boots on the street reporting. And so, and, that, and that's, we love those. So it's all over the map where we get stories. And from other media too. I mean, we do some, some aggregation. We like to try to put our own kind of spin and perspective on things, but we, we certainly pay attention to, to other media outlets and what they're reporting on and, and we, get, we get information there. So I guess I'm getting back into your second part of your question. How much comes in through press releases? God, I don't know. I think we got asked this uh, before. Um, it depends what a press release is. I mean, a lot is coming in through a pitch of some sort or somebody providing information through an email. Um, I don't know, maybe half. Uh, I would, it's a rough estimate. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for places to find out like what technology people are talking about, um, Hacker News is a great source for that. Hacker News is, is a, a site based on Reddit um, where people that are generally um, doers in the field, coders, designers, um, go and hang out and talk about the stories. And so they're the ones doing most of the voting up on the stories and the voting down on stories. So it's less of like a what's, what's the world talking about, and it's more like what are coders talking about? What are, what, are, what are the feet on the street talking about? So it's really interesting. And if you don't want to actually go to the site itself, they have uh, certain levels of Twitter accounts you can follow. So there's like Hacker News 10, Hacker News 50, Hacker News 100, and it's basically Twitter accounts that only tweet out stories that have gotten that number of votes. So like I'm subscribed to Hacker News 100 because I just I don't want like a million things in my Twitter feed. I just you know if it gets to 100 votes, it's important. I want to know about it. So that's a good way to kind of keep up with you know what what are the feet on the street actually talking about and get excited about. Yeah, and you know just like in uh, in actual intelligence, the the best stuff is human generated, right? It's relationships. It's talking to sources. It's talking to people. And I don't remember who said it, but it is a quote I've read before that news is what I'm not supposed to know and everything else is just publicity. And that's always going to be true. And so um, just keep that in mind. I think business news in particular, there's a high proportion of news that comes off press releases. There just, just is because the companies are private by nature. You know, it's not like a city, it's not a government or, or a sporting event or something like that. So if you look at the daily report in our newspaper and the business section, you know, a lot of the stuff in there, frankly, is going to be press release origi originated at some point, say a company announced, you know, iPhone 4S was a press release, really. I mean, they handed out the press release at a big fancy press conference, but it was a press release. You know, and if your company gets sold or, you know, the, the, the times when you cross the threshold for it being newsworthy no matter what, you will issue a press release when your company is sold. If you raise a hundred million dollars, if you know, those big news events all have a press release. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only place we get it is from the press release, you know, but there's sort of a blend of sources and all the different reporting. But, you know, kind of day in, day out, bread and butter, the business page, there's a press release involved at some point in, in most of those stories, frankly. The original stories are rare, unfortunately. You know, we don't, we just don't have enough time, but that's the good stuff, is, is the stuff that you generate yourself. Or you might even get a press release that says this company's starting and you might not write the story that day, but you may use that press release to develop a bigger story or a trend story down the road or something like that. And we've been talking about technology and business coverage for the most part, but I mean, there are niches around all sorts of coverage. I mean, politics, I mean, Kurt, you can talk about that as a former politics guy. I mean, uh, there's public cola, there's neighborhood blogs like my Ballard and West Seattle blog. If you have a very local neighborhoody type of business that you can go and target and that's probably smart to do. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's just been this wide, just crazy transformation of media and these niche kind of oriented content that's risen up. Uh, and you kind of have to know your niche and know who the players are in the media sphere that you need to target within that, with that, in that realm. You know, Hacker News and Tech Meme are two great sources in the tech beat, but I'm sure if you're covering, or if you're, if you're interested in politics or schools or food or whatever, there's something out there for you. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask you a question about something you said earlier about being ready. Um, because I'm an entrepreneur, and I think everybody here in some form or another is an entrepreneur. And um, sometimes they're just never really ready. And <laughs> I mean, I can give you an example from personal experience, several of them. Um, years ago, uh, YouTube bought, or, or Google bought YouTube. They called it YouTube in the media, or Google, YouTube in the media, and stuff like that. Uh, about a year and a half prior, um, I was the guy who bought 
GooTube.com for a different business idea that I thought was a fantastic concept, right? And so when Google bought YouTube, that would have been a great time to jump on that story and tell everybody about my, tell the world about my idea, but I wasn't ready. And, you know, whether it's money or development or, you know, just not being able to scale up, you know, you, you just aren't always ready. And so I'm wondering, um, are you ever interested in great business concepts that aren't really businesses? Do you write about those? Do you care about those? Um, and also, um, do, you, do you ever think you'd find yourself in a position where you think so much of a business concept that you would kind of want to incubate it or, or hold the hand of that, that person till the story is ready? I've done some of that in the past. Mike, Mike just reminded me of a, a feature that I did uh, where I followed the path of, of two entrepreneurs as they got their company off the ground. And really, and I've actually done this a couple times during my career. Um, and it's been really fun to kind of follow the trek of a startup from beginning to end, well, end or as far as you can get them, get with them, uh, you know. Uh, but as a general rule, you know, we're looking for, there are plenty of ideas out there and plenty of concepts. And for the most part, you know, given the inflow of information that we have to deal with, with, with companies that are launching or putting real products out there, what have you, it, it, we don't have a lot of time to just say, hey, this, uh, this is an interesting concept or a cool idea. All that said, you know, there are, once again, kind of getting back to telling your story, like the GooTube thing, I, there probably was an opportunity to come out and maybe you should have sold the domain at the time or what have you, but, uh, but to come out and tell that story and still probably get uh, relationships uh, built with, with the media that may have helped uh, further down the path. Um, but um, yeah, anyone else have comments on that? I was gonna say, there's a, as far as, you know, one thing that you said at the end about, you know, maybe helping an entrepreneur along the way or something like that. Um, the way John described it was probably as far as any of us would go, I guess, which is, we're not, I mean, we're just there to watch during this process. Like, I'm not, you know, you don't want to come to me for business advice. I mean, I can tell you that first of all, but, um, you know, maybe media relations advice, that would be it. But, um, you know, there, there is a little bit of a phenomenon in the, particularly in the, as I've noticed, in the tech blogging world of tech bloggers coming out and being like, look, guys, I'm on your side, right? Come on, you could talk to me. I can tell you who the VCs are in town are, who do you want to talk to? And that's a bit of a dividing line. I mean, me, myself, and it, it's kind of old school, but, you know, I still think there's value in the reporters being the referees, kind of you know, in a sense, like, I don't want you to fail and I don't want you to succeed. I just want you to talk to me, you know, <laughs> that's it. I, you know, I don't care if you blow up and I don't care if you crash and burn. And that may not always seem valuable, but I swear you will find the value in somebody who is honestly just there to try and talk to people and write stories about it. Um, I, I personally think that that's gonna continue to, to have a piece of value there. So. Yeah, and as far as being ready, I, you know, the only thing that you can do to really get a sense of what makes a story or how people write stories is just to read it, read a lot of stuff, right? Like that's how you learn how to write is by reading a lot. Um, so if you get a sense of what, you know, the certain kinds of tech or business coverage that you might be interested in getting someday might be, read a lot of that stuff. You'll get a sense of the tone, what people cover, right? What kind of stories are interesting to you? You, when you get that voice kind of building up in your head and you recognize it, then you'll know, you know, oh, well, if I said it this way on my blog and said, hey, everybody, look, I own, you know, this domain that's in the news, hey, you know, you, you got a shot. I think for, for many of us, uh, one, of, one source we, I think all of us use is, uh, the, there's a ton of places that have these little pitching sessions, you know, they give you a, you know, two minute pitch or a five minute pitch. And, uh, Sometimes those will, will turn into stories. Generally, we want to see, you know, if we put something in, in the magazine that's going to be sitting on somebody's coffee table for five or six months, we, we don't want it to maybe be bank, you know, out of business but, you know, by the time someone picks it up. So we want, to, we want to see either that there's some sort of experience management, you know, they've, they've done something, you know, they've proven that they, they could, you know, make a company work, or there's been a fair amount of money committed to it, um, 
but if it, if, it, if, if, if it isn't there, there's a possibility of, for, in, in, in a different context, for example, you know, a couple of years, when, when the first, uh, when the financial crisis first hit and unemployment surged, we kind of did a speculative story on, you know, is this going to increase the number of startups, you know, or with all these people unemployed, are a lot of people going to go out and, and do startups? And I just put a, put a you know, a sort of general query out to a bunch of people's networks and just got comments from people who were, were starting up and, and talked to people. Many of these were very early stage ideas, but it was more about a, a lifestyle thing than about specifically about that particular business. But, but we obviously got into the business idea and the stories. So where do you suggest that? Okay, one more quick example, <laughs> just because it, it relates to this. Um, you know, a couple years before eHow came on the scene, uh, I, had this, I had this website called How To Flix, which is the exact thing that eHow is. But it was nothing but that concept and a, and a design, you know, of a, of a website. And I found myself sitting next to, across from Michael Arrington, and he asked me about my idea, and I told him about it. And he said, that's a great idea. That will work. And if you had a business right now, I would write about it. Um, and I took that, I had written it down, and I took it home and put it in my diaper bag. Because <laughs> I was busy at the time. I was a dad and I had a lot of things going on. So where do you, in your experience, since you, you're in this, in this field of knowing things, where do you take that kind of advice from somebody who knows the, you know, somebody who knows what's going on? You know, they say, hey, that's a great idea. So then what? Well, I, I think particularly in the startup realm, you, you're going to have to find the community of other people who are like you. And um, there's a lot of ink spilled and a lot of kind of hand wringing. And John's written about it, I think, just today about let's stop doing that and talk more about, you know, <laughs> um, why, why there's not more of that community and seedbed for, for companies in Seattle. But, you know, I don't know because I've never started a company. Actually, John's probably better to answer this. But go where the entrepreneurs are, hang out with them. Particularly in technology, one thing that you find it's it's a very people want to show their work and share, and they get validation by building things and telling other people how they built it. Um, that goes all the way through that whole culture. Yeah, you're not your business isn't going to be made by one reporter or journalist uh, telling you it's a good idea or even writing about it, and so. Following up on what Kurt was saying, you got to go out there and prove it. You got to prove it within the community. You got to get users. You got to get traction. I mean, Mike's been through this before, so he can probably speak to it. I'm just passing passing the baton down, but uh, you know, it's it's hard work. It's 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 really tough to start a new business up and and to take it from that idea stage and written on the back of a napkin to actually executing and and building something and and. You know, that's technically when we get interested is when you've started to build something, and you've started to get traction, you've started to raise money, and started to hire a lot of people, and yeah, you know, that's when we start to get engaged. Now, we do a, at GeekWire, we do a decent amount of coverage of pretty early stage stuff, and I'm out at the pitch events, and I write about them sometimes in a kind of a fun, fun way, and and we have a. a a feature on the site called Startup Spotlight, where we I try to find a pretty early stage company and to show them, but they usually have a product on the market, um, and so we do try to have an avenue for these pretty early stage companies as well, because I think it is important to highlight those and showcase those. Um, but you gotta you gotta get your you gotta get from the idea phase to the to the business phase and prove out the concept. Um, there's an important concept also to, to remember when you're when you're talking about your own ideas and, and that is it's okay to drink your own Kool-Aid but don't drink your family's Kool-Aid and don't drink your friend's Kool-Aid and what I mean by that is your friend your family and friends are very likely to tell you that they love your idea and it's great and they, they want to give you all this validation and even if they don't they don't really want to offend you so it's important to find impartial people like Mike to, to he's not but he didn't know you at the time and you didn't have an existing relationship he, he, might not to interrupt here, but he talked about this at Don't the he, st he he talked about this at the startup weekend about uh, how he kind of just brushes off people and tells people that it's just a great idea, just so they don't bug him. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> not, not not to rain on your parade, but yeah. but I, but that's sometimes what happens. 
that, that, that's a that's a very that's a very good point. It's like even if you don't know the person, who knows what their you know who, who knows what their agenda is. But I think a good sign is if people that you don't have an existing relationship with like your idea and and give you the you know the motivation to continue. By the way, my favorite my favorite qu canned question that you always ask people in in that startup spotlight thing is how are you going to dominate the world? <laughs> and my and my favorite answer was that wine company is like we're not going to dominate the world. We just rate wine. <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, there's a, a, one specific concrete example is uh, kind of old school as far as technology goes, but here in town, uh, there's a really heavily trafficked email list called Seattle Tech Startups. And you see people, I mean, from time to time with stories just like yours, like, guys, you know, long time lurker, first, you know, I got an idea here. <clears throat> what do you think? And that sharing culture of early stage entrepreneurs and builders and coders who want to share knowledge, who have been in that position, uh, you know, have been kind of psyched out by, I don't know if I'm right or if I'm crazy. You know, they've been through it and people will do that or they'll bounce, you know, product ideas, try our alpha tests, um, find that and get on it. Um, that's just one thing and it's, it's, it's pretty well trafficked by people around town. I think we'll take one last question and then we will call it uh, for, call it an evening. Um, just a simple well, question. Well, maybe, maybe we'll take two, sorry. This one's actually pretty simple. Do you like or even want pitches via Facebook, Twitter, you know, whatever the next social media um, outlet will be? Sure, it's just another form to get, uh, get information to me, that's fine. I don't like phone calls. Uh, they're a little disruptive in my day. So yeah, email, Twitter message, Facebook message is fine. I, I don't mind that, but I probably won't see it, frankly. I mean, the signal to noise on those is so poor that you know, you can throw it on Twitter all you want, and maybe if you do it 300 times, I might see it in my stream if I am subscribing to your thing. So you go, go for it. But it, it, that's really to, sort of one to many, not, not a point to point communication thing. Yeah, I was thinking a direct message on Twitter, which is essentially the same. But I'll, an at reply might get my attention too. I, I would just confirm the idea of, of not phoning. I think, I think uh, <laughs> it just doesn't work very well. Email is really, for, for us, the best, best way. Yeah. You have a question? Uh, yes. Um, uh, very related to that question, um, you guys have mentioned Twitter a couple times, also Facebook. Um, any, any further advice on how, I guess, you know, corporate social media strategy, you know, do, can we push our interesting anecdotes out on Facebook? Because like you said, that's where everybody gets their news and you know, does Twitter have to be a part of that? I mean, is there any other guidance there on how businesses, especially small ones and entrepreneurs, should be harnessing those for, for pushing out their message? Or is that a waste because it's, you know, signal to noise ratio is too low? Any, any comments would be appreciated. There is guidance on that, and people will charge you a lot of money to tell you about it, <laughs> and it's not me. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, consultants who will tell you that stuff. Um, I just think, to the previous comment, it's, it's a tool and it's a channel. There are a lot of tools and a lot of channels today. Um, for me, one thing, I, I love Twitter. I'm on it all the time. I find out lots of stuff there. And it's not pitches or, hey, we launched our product today. It's when I see conversations happening between two or three entrepreneurs or investors um, that seems interesting and I follow up on it. And that's more of like stories I w want to write versus have to write kind of thing. That's super interesting when you can just watch conversations happen. Or like these guys were saying in the comment threads, you see, you know, authentic information being exchanged. So you have to know what the message is and whether it fits the cultural norm of the platform, right? Don't go out and try and jam an email pitch on Twitter or Facebook. Do a Facebook thing on Facebook. That's not very sophisticated, but. <laughs> also, just, the, just remembering the general concept, people don't follow companies, people follow people. So nobody's going to follow your company XYZ Twitter account if it's just releasing news about your company. But if you, the CEO, have a Twitter account and you mention interesting things that are going on and conundrums that you have and problems that you have, um, that's, that's the sort of stuff that people are interested in, both on Facebook and on Twitter. So the more human you can make it, the better. One, one little last thing too is if you think carefully about uh, the, the exclusivity thing too, because it, you, you know, you're, you're doing one thing by broadcasting widely there, that's, that's fine, no problem. But you, you may be able to trade, or you, know, you may be able to pique our interest with something exclusive. So something special is happening, some newsworthy thing around your company. You can approach one of us and say, hey, I got something you might like to write about. You know, frankly, if you've already blasted it out on Facebook and Twitter, that you don't have that card to play anymore when you approach the journalists. 
Well, I'd like to thank both our panelists and our audience for an excellent session. Um, I think that uh, I think it certainly furthers a um, symbiotic relationship between the stories and the storytellers. And uh, there people may be here for a few minutes afterward if you have additional questions. And thank you very much for attending tonight. Thank you.